It's, uh, I have uh, rising time, 9.58. Does anybody object if we get started? All right. I want to thank everybody for coming out to the first candidates town hall meeting. Uh, it's the first of two. Uh, the next one will be next Wednesday. Um, I believe it's at 7 o'clock. Um, and I want to also thank uh, the candidates for uh, committing to run for this the two offices or the two positions on the Bentwater Property Owners Association Board of Trustees. Um, I would like to start by uh, outlining the agenda or the guidelines for this town hall meeting. The candidates will speak uh, for 15 minutes. Um, they can take questions or speak however they'd like. Uh, we do have a microphone and I will try to get around to people who have questions and uh, so you can state them in your um, normal voice. <clears throat> there will be a, a five minute warning and a two minute warning for each candidate uh, when they get to the end of their 15 minute allotted time. And I'm asking them to, when it gets down to the final bell, for them to uh, sit, and I will introduce the next candidate. We'll introduce the candidates by alphabetical order, which will be Cam Cope, Gary Island, Al Fadul, Jim Hostetler, Chris Howell, and Steve Cook. At the second town hall meeting, uh, that order will be reversed. Um, we have the re room reserved for two hours. If everything goes as scheduled, we should be done with the candidates' formal presentations in an hour and 30 minutes. And there will be an extra 30 minutes uh, after the formal presentations for people to come up and ask questions if, if they so choose to do so. Uh, the Meeting will be filmed or videoed and will be posted on the uh, POA website um, as soon as technically possible. I don't know when that is, but I assume it will be not today and sometime <laughs> next, early next week. Thank you for your participation. And um, Cam Cope, you're on. Okay. Again, uh, thank you for being here. I think it's dedication that brings uh, you here and wanting to be involved in the community. And I'm again uh, repeating the thanks that he's given you for being here. And uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Cam Cope. Uh, it's not short for anything, it's just Cam Cope, named after my grandfather. And so we are uh, residents. We've owned two homes here in Bentwater. Uh, we attend North Shore uh, Church here on Bentwater. And uh, we've been uh, somewhat active. My wife and I uh, try to make as many events as we can here in Bentwater. And we have, uh, I don't know whether we're supposed to announce, we have a wino function tonight, but. <laughs> 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 so, uh, anyway, uh, we are uh, thrilled to be here. We're uh, glad to be a part of this community and uh, enjoy uh, the people. That's one of the reasons why we moved here. Uh, we bought an introductory house first and then moved to another house uh, after we decided that we really liked the people uh, here in this community, and so we made that our uh, choice to uh, live here. And so uh, I own uh, Auto Fire and Safety Corporation and have owned a couple of corporations that have been very, very successful uh, in the uh, past. Uh, I'm an Aggie and a uh, military uh, veteran, uh, served in Vietnam, 
uh, for an extended period of time. And uh, Auto Fire and Safety Corporation uh, is located in the Woodlands area. Uh, we're just a little east of, uh, on the woods, Woodlands side, uh, but we have uh, 30 some, 38 acres, and we have 30,000 square foot of building there. Uh, and we have employees. I do consulting for the, some of the largest law firms in the United States. Uh, we are pursuing various accidents usually that have occurred uh, in America. I also teach uh, on the policies, procedures with regards to uh, corporations and how uh, they are run and what the safety issues are uh, for it. And so uh, that's primarily, I'm basically a testifying expert. I've testified uh, over 300 times, I think, against uh, Ford, uh, General Motors, Chrysler, uh, most of the larger manufacturers. But a, larger, the, a lot of the bigger developments, uh, MGM Grand, the San Juan Puerto Rico fire, uh, several of the uh, Hershey plant factory, uh, I've done a lot of those particular things. And so I'm hoping I bring that talent uh, here to help at Bentwater and uh, to make it where we are beginning to organize. And my job really in this consulting field is to bring people together. It is to bring lawyers together, it's to bring owners together. And that's one of the things that I've been hired primarily to do. That's where my success has been, is organizing and bringing people together. And how is it that you not only make this community safer, but how do you make it where it's more beneficial to the residents as well as increasing their property values? I think that that's very important. And that's something that that's where it requires research. And what I've been famous for is research and teaching probably. And so I think that we need to uh, continue with that here if we're going to improve and we're going to make it a better area. How do we work with everybody to make the pools nicer? How do we clean up the lakes to make them where kids could actually go fishing there? Some of them are small tasks that we could do if we had the organization, everybody would get along. I think that those are things that are not high dollar items things that just take people working together. And we have a lot of people who will volunteer to work on cleaning up a lake or that will work towards a dog park or something. Uh, but it's taking that coordination of getting people to work together. And that's the key that I'm hoping to do to make uh, this a better uh, community. And so it, um, is my talent and uh, our men's group that we have uh, every Wednesday night has what brought me into this because in our men's group uh, we have about, I don't know, 40 or 50 men that generally attend on Wednesday night, but a large number from Bentwater. It's non-denominational, there's not a church there. Uh, but it's really helped me uh, to work with concrete owners and uh, builders, developers, Wise and Baker and some of the other ones that are there. Uh, but one of the things that they had brought up that I thought was important was use your work-related talents to bless your community. And <clears throat> I thought that was important to me just recently. And that's why I signed up for this task or to see what I can do to benefit the community. And uh, with the help of my wife, uh, she is the coordinator for our, a lot of things here in the community, and so a lot of people know my wife. But I think it's, uh, as a testifying expert, it's based on our integrity and uh, the honor that we are gonna bring to people. Trust, uh, people have to trust us as far as things that are going to go. How is it that we determine 
what the best benefit for our money is. Uh, is it building a barn dominium for 600000 That may be the very best source, but it's research that has to be provided to the residents. But I think that here in Bentwater, I've met the, the, some of the brightest people uh, that I know. People that have come out of uh, Exxon, Chevron. These are people that live here that are very, very knowledgeable. I'm not as knowledgeable, but I know that I can go to them and ask them, what do you think we can do to improve the lakes that we do already have here? How do we make those to make it a better place for people to come in and see? And when you drive by it, you're selling a piece of property and you drive by and you see a bunch of 10 year old kids out there fishing because it's a fishing day for them. It's beneficial to us as homeowners to have that in place. And you people know what it's gonna take. You know how to do it. You just need to relay it to me. I need to come to you and ask you for help. I'm gonna do it. I'm not as knowledgeable as everybody else. I have always relied on the witnesses in all accidents and litigation. I rely on people to tell me, how do we solve the problem? How do we go by the scientific methodology? You use that scientific methodology in everything, including working with this neighborhood. You have to go through in order to be able to document, to do the research that tells you that the best way to preserve the roadway, for example, on a promenade <clears throat> is to pour tar on it. If that's the best scientific methodology, we need to use it. Uh, but for me, I look at it and say, what is that tar in a spaghetti pattern doing in front of my house? And they make black tar and they make gray tar. And so, I'm just as an example. Uh, but, you know, number one, we live in the South. Uh, freezing rain and freezing concrete's not always a problem here as it is up Pennsylvania or someplace. But we have to be able to determine whether this is going to preserve that roadway and it's going to benefit and the cost is correct on it. And gray is not as good as black. It's tar. So you put gray tar so that it blends in so we don't have something. And this is a complaint that I hear uh, on promenade where I live uh, that, that they're just saying, you know, we need to look at the options. And I would tell you that I'd rather have gray than black. But uh, that's primarily my focus. I think that you have a couple of minutes. Uh, if there's something in particular that you want to ask me, uh, I'm open to any type of criticism, <laughs> uh, information. Uh, I'm always available by phone. You can call my wife and I, we'll meet you someplace. And so, if there's something, go ahead, ma'am. <coughs> Hi, in your write-up, you said making bent water safer is of the utmost importance, and yet in your talk just now, you didn't mention it at all. What are you referring to? Uh, safety is something that I've been concerned about because that's my job. Uh, but safety is, yeah, a specific would be uh, to clean up the swimming pool, for example, so that people are not getting uh, ear infections. I hear a lot of this that people want the pool to be cleaner. If it's cleaner, it's safer. And I think that the other issue is the speed limits and the roads that are here in our surface. I've worked three major accidents here on Bentwater Drive alone. And the speeds were on one of them 100 miles an hour. I think that 100 miles an hour is dangerous and I think that we might as well not even have speed limit signs here. Uh, because, you know, some of those have been, those have been near fatal where people went to the hospital. And we have one person who's in a wheelchair for life as a result of one of the accidents. 
And so, uh, who's here to care? And I think that safety... What would you recommend to fix, to fix that? I'm not, I believe that speed bumps help. Uh, I think that they're important. They work very well in April Sound and Walden. And I think they've been influential over there with reducing or helping to reduce accidents. I think we hire law enforcement officers. We pay them. Why are they not writing any tickets? But I think that if you have a general 35 mile an hour posted speed limit and you're giving people a 10 mile an hour leeway, but if they're 45 and over, then they get a ticket. And then use that money to make the swimming pool cleaner, safer, uh, put more into the lakes or a dog park, but utilize the money that you make from that. But that will, you put people out there and they start writing tickets, you won't have people driving 100 miles an hour. And I think that that is important to me on uh, safety. Uh, I care about that, electrical, fires, things that have been related to lightning strikes and stuff out here. I think there's a lot of things that are related to safety, but speed limit. We have people on Bentwater that drive 60, 65, 70 miles an hour. That's my business. I know it. And I think that it's inappropriate to do that. And so how do you go about beginning to post so that you're going to control that? Everybody thinks they're bulletproof. I do black box data from all cars all over the United States. And it's available information. All three of those big major wrecks that we had on Bentwater Drive, you could have downloaded the black box. Nobody did. <clears throat> I don't know that anybody went to jail. <clears throat> Any, what else? <laughs> Where do you buy your shirts? <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> I get these Robert Graham shirts. My wife is a uh, very coordinated person. I think that the main portion that I would like to see is where the board is working more with the residents so that we have a communication between the, the board and the residents where we're actually getting input from the residents that ahead of time they're going to say we don't want black spaghetti on promenade and what else can we possibly do to improve that and is the barn dominium something that that's where we want to spend six hundred thousand dollars or is it the roadway so is that the best source that we build a building and then somebody says oh by the way we need to spend another hundred thousand for the road to go up to it then i'm wondering you know what else is it how do we best spend the money if that's the best way then uh, so be it we've done our job uh, thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you Well, Terry, thanks for the introduction, and it's good to see you here this morning. Let me say that since I did drive by the driving range in the first tee box of uh, Weisskopf and Miller this morning, we're not, the driving range is not missing very many people uh, to attend the meet and greet this morning, but uh, it is a great summer weekend in Bentwater, and also so happens to be the last weekend before school begins, so there are a lot of activities. Uh, and along that vein, let me tell you that this is the major social weekend for the Island family uh, in Bentwater. By mid-afternoon this afternoon, we will have 12 couples that date back to my undergraduate days at the University of Texas in the early 70s visiting. Seven of those couples arrived last night, so uh, our house is not big enough to accommodate, so we also are, are great uh, users of the villas. And uh, so we have a good group, and I'm expecting any time uh, since we have a 
uh, shrimp and crab boil uh, each Saturday afternoon when this group is in town, and that is catered by yours truly, uh, that my wife will be a panic a little bit saying, when are you going to be here working to prepare for the uh, shrimp and crab boil this afternoon? Uh, for his background, uh, you've seen, I uh, assume that you'll have the opportunity to see my biography uh, that was posted on the POA website. Uh, this week I also posted uh, on the Bentwater Live uh, a statement uh, for your consideration. Uh, but I guess I might just begin that uh, I am one of your elected officials from two years ago when uh, the POA and the Architectural Control Committee transitioned from being developer control to property owner control. So I was one of the, uh, the first elected members of the Architectural Control Committee and have worked carefully with uh, Eric Feller, uh, Robert Yetter, uh, Terry Bowie here, uh, and others uh, as we have considered uh, various uh, proposals that have come before the ACC this past uh, two years. Importantly, we have taken some, very, we took some very helpful uh, steps to make that a more efficient operation. Uh, and working with Eric and Terry, and uh, we, for example, uh, in, historically the ACC has met uh, the, uh, twice a month on the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month and you ended up with a stack of applications that could range anything from being new home construction to just simple repainting of the same color on the exterior. And so we quickly identified, instead of having these huge, huge agendas, that we would implement a, uh, an email review and approval process for relatively minor types of projects. And those include, as I said, simple repainting, uh, same color, simple roof replacements, same color roof and the like. And so that process has worked very well to give you quicker feedback on those relatively minor projects. We obviously continue to review carefully uh, any more major projects, including new home construction. Uh, that's worked very well. We looked at various of the policies that existed, many of which had not been updated in 20 plus years. And so have begun to update some of those and those have been very helpful for you. Maybe as importantly is as part of that process, uh, we have a significant 70 plus uh, number of sections in Bentwater and they each have their own uh, conditions, uh, the CCRs that uh, basically are deed restrictions that apply. Uh, each time we get an application, we actually have to work with Eric to review those CCRs to assure that the application is in compliance. Uh, so I've had the occasion uh, to become familiar with many, if not most, uh, or all of the CCRs for the various sections. Uh, it's also helpful that I'm an attorney, and so that's part of my livelihood, uh, is to be able to undersect, understand, dissect uh, any type of contractual document uh, or legal transactional document that exists. But so I have been one of your elected officials. I decided not to seek re-election this time in order to be able to stand for election to your POA Board of Trustees. Uh, I would uh, you know, suggest, as I said in my little ben, uh, Bentwater Live publication there, uh, in a simple statement, what my objectives are, are to preserve, protect, and enhance property values and amenities uh, that exist in Bentwater. I'm very familiar with uh, the issues, especially the amenities, uh, Sandy and I bought our first lot in Bentwater in 1993 when we lived in Tomball. And we came up to play golf because that was one of our primary mission. Also pulled our boat up for the kids to be on the lake and we enjoyed that time. We bought our first house in Bentwater in 2009. Two years later there was something called a drought. Uh, so we ended up selling that house and buying a second house. Uh, the other thing you should know is that many of you know my wife Sandy, who would be, love to be here. Like I said, she's entertaining seven or eight couples by now at the house. Uh, but we have also been on the uh, Bentwater Christmas holiday tour of homes, not once, but twice uh, since 2009, since we've lived here. So many of you have had a chance to visit with us, visit our homes, and, and that certainly uh, indicates a willingness to listen and to be open. And so I have many contacts from, from you. But the key really is to preserve, protect, and enhance. Uh, what I am known for is the ability to listen, and that is key. I mean, when I mentor uh, young attorneys, uh, I tell them, 
It's not so much what you have learned in law school. It's not so much how quickly you can uh, recite underlying statutory or regulatory provisions. It's have you listened to the client and clearly identify what their objectives are. And then you can begin to analyze that situation and make good recommendations and counsel the client. That's what we try to do in the ACC. That's what I would in intend to do uh, with respect to a position on the Bentwater POA. As I said, I've uh, represented, uh, Cam was talking about background. Uh, I was in the practice of law for 40 plus years uh, with uh, some of the major law firms in, in Houston. Uh, also had the good fortune to uh, be a health law attorney. Now many people will say, what is a health law attorney? First thing I say is, do not think of medical malpractice. We do not do tort law, that's tort law. We represent major hospital systems, large physician groups, uh, hospital corporations, and the like, and also my single largest client for 30 plus years has been a little institution called the University of Texas System, and it's 14 major academic and health institutions across the state. So whether you think of MD Anderson Cancer Center, or UT Southwestern in Dallas, or UTMB in Galveston, we represent them on major business transactions where they acquire other hospital systems. We also represent them on health regulatory matters before various federal agencies, uh, including how to determine what their proper payments are from the Medicare and Medicaid program, since many of you are Medicare eligible. And uh, also, uh, because we are the regulatory experts, we also are involved in defense of government investigations that do occur from time to time. Uh, so they have kept us very busy and uh, have also uh, had the, ability, the, the need to appear uh, before uh, legislative branches of both uh, federal and state uh, government uh, to consider various issues. Uh, again, the goal of mine will be to listen to you, to take that in, to analyze the underlying uh, corporate documents, and here are the major underlying corporate documents are the CCRs. Make sure I'm, you're familiar with them, to dissect them and to understand. And also to understand kind of how Bentwater is structured. Bentwater was a development by the Bielan family, and uh, this is a private enclave. That's why we have front gates. Uh, that's why our roads are private roads. That's why law enforcement officers do not issue speeding tickets in Bentwater is because those are private roads. Now obviously if they have public intoxication and stuff like that, that's a different uh, animal. Uh, but there are significant issues there. I think most of us feel much safer that we have gated entries. And so it's gonna be important to, as I said, protect, preserve, and enhance uh, the amenities that are there. Uh, and, and again, I understand those amenities. We've been uh, familiar with uh, Bentwater uh, since 1993. We live here, we love it. And the other factor you should know is after 40 plus years of the practice of law, as of July 31, 2019, I have officially retired. So I now have a significant uh, greater amount of time and certainly have a lot of energy uh, to devote to your representation on the POA board. With that, let me just uh, stop and open up for, for questions. Dean, <laughs> Terry in the back. Well, you know, keep in mind that uh, you mentioned some of the discussion. I'm not, have not been privy to the discussion that have already occurred on the POA. So but very interested in understanding kind of what the discussion has been and what resolution, if any, has been made. Now, sometimes, you know, understand resolutions before political subdivisions, sometimes we're tabling it to a later date, and sometimes that simply occurs. 
But uh, transparency, I think, is always important. But you keep in mind that the Bentwater POA is, in essence, a nonprofit corporation. Under a, a public nonprofit corporation, homeowners association, the board constitutes the elected representatives of the re property owners of Bentwater. So we elect the board to take care of our interest uh, and to be diligent in their activities. We've only had a property owner controlled POA for a little over two years now. So I think I would suggest that uh, even though one can debate some issue here or there, they had, have done a very significant and I think great job in doing the transition from being a developer controlled POA to being a property owner POA. But I, again, communication back, uh, whatever the types of vehicles that may be available, to report back as to actions taken would be very helpful. Yes? Well, again, you would have to go back and look. I'm relying upon information I received from some of the uh, uh, POA representatives as to reasons why we do not have tickets issued here in town. Again, that's part, that's part of the issues that we can examine more closely uh, if on the board. Okay, any other questions here? Because I only have two minutes left. So let's not, these gentlemen, you'll have plenty of time to speak to. Just a quick Over here. Well, my, my question is more about, you're saying that, that it's not really him, though. It's based on what you just said. You're saying that April Sound hires their own, but don't we also pay police to come here? So what are we getting for that money? We pay constables uh, on a part-time basis. We do not hire police. We do not have sheriff patrols. So I'll let Barry have some time back. Okay, there was a question in the back over here, or was that directed at someone else? Okay. Well, again, uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we're always open, we listen, and uh, we take action after due deliberation and consideration of the objective uh, parameters that we operate within. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the next candidate is Al Fadul. Al? Hello, everyone. How you doing? Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I, who, I, who am I? My name's Albert Fadul, right? Uh, my wife, Jan, and I have lived here for three years. Um, I got introduced to Bentwater uh, visiting my brother, who also lives here in Bentwater. So over the years, uh, we visited, and we really fell in love with the place. Um, so we made a decision to come and, and move from Michigan, a nice cold area down to here. And we just, and we, and we love it, right? Um, I'm gonna tell you my vision, right? When, when I'm looking at things, um, I think that my vision is to provide superior customer service to all the individuals here, all the members, uh, protect the quality of the environment, ensure equal access to all the resources to all the members, and to provide transparency through regular communications with the members. That's my vision. Um, how am I prepared to be part of and to be elected by you to serve on the board? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I am, I am a uh, certified cybersecurity professional. Not certifiable, but certified. Um, what that entails is for me to work with companies and do business impact assessments, do cyber assessments for an organization. And what you do is that you look at the physical, the technical, and the administrative processes of an organization. And we investigate those. We also create governments to manage risk. And this comes in a form of policies and procedures. Policies, policies and procedures need to abide by 
regulations that abide to the customer that I work with. So if it's healthcare, you have HIPAA, you may have high tech, definitely uh, is an act, uh, Texas Administrative Code, uh, Texas H Bill 300. So those regulations need to be abided by in your processes. And so what I do is I make sure that the processes are being followed. Investigative. So I also help organizations create those policies, create those procedures. Um, when we look at risk, we want to make sure that all avenues are investigated. Um, this, when you talk about physical security, fences, gates, things like that, um, people, the safety of people, um, technical processes. In the cyber community, uh, the business is booming. There's a, you've heard a lot about hacking from China and things like that. That is happening. It's occurring more than you know. Uh, I belong to an organization called InfraGuard. It's a partnership uh, with the FBI, and we share information. And the FBI shares a lot of information about industry, oil, gas, healthcare. Um, I come from a healthcare background. I was a CIO for a hospital in southeastern Michigan. Um, I helped the organization go from paper to electronic medical record. And there could be some physicians out there, uh, if you participated in that, it was brutal. Um, when managing an organization, you have to deal with people and you have to bring these people together and you also have to look at the stakeholders and make sure all the stakeholders are being addressed and make sure that you can do what you do without affecting the people inside the hospital namely the patients. So when you look at uh, an IT, um, just about everything affects the patient. So we had to make sure that all of the 35 discrete departments inside a hospital, which are basically companies, uh, because no department works exactly as the same, all intermingled. And they all came together and worked on the same thing. So I'm very familiar with working with processes and procedures, identifying risk, uh, and making sure that they're addressed. Um, I'd like to hear from you, I'd like to hear some questions from you as far as what do you expect to see in a board member? Yeah. My question for you would be, um, Patty Santos, I don't know if that was mandatory. Um, <laughs> my question for you would be, you talked about the laws and the covenants, so here, here's a question I think that is out there right now. Mm -hmm. if, if the law or the covenant has uh, questionable, like two different people or two different lawyers are saying two different things about it. Would you tend to lean toward the stronger version or the lighter version? Well, it depends on what we're looking at. Um, you always have to determine what the facts are and make sure they're actually facts and not opinions. So the, the CCNRs is the big kahuna of the, the government of, of, of Bentwater, right? So we'd have to take a look at that. People, when they come to Bentwater, they're, they're, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, investment, retirement, the community, whatnot. So there's a lot of different interests from that. But we've all agreed on all the documents that we have in place, all right? So expectations, we have to manage people's expectations. So if in, in, in our guidelines, in our CCRs, it says X, then as a board, we're responsible to make sure that that occurs, that those CCRs are mandated. If they're not, um, if they need to be changed, then we need to open up a discussion with the membership, right, and decide whether or not they need to be changed. Because everything that's in our, our, our covenants and CCRs can be changed. There's a process for it. Um, it's listed inside our bylaws and how to do those types of things. Um, whether or not we do them, it really depends upon the membership. You know, does it make sense, right? Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Do you think you got a speeding issue in that water in our streets? Uh, uh, say again? Do you think you got a speeding issue in our streets up there? Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. People will drive at a speed that they think is safe. And what I like to see, I know, what they think is safe. What I do like to see is I do like to see the, uh, uh, the, the radar gun speed sign. It tells it because there's been times where I've come up, I'm um, thinking about something else. Oh, let's slow down. 
Um, recently on, on Edgewood, it was, uh, the, the speed sign was put up there, and I never ever thought that I was going faster than 25 miles an hour on the speed, but by having that sign there, it helped me realize that it isn't. Do I think that there's a speeding problem? I see people speed every time I'm out there, every time. So, yes, it could be. No, no, no. Um, it's people think it's safe to go through that, but you have those those areas. And and how do we how do we stop that? How do we protect that? What what can we do? As do we put paint on the street to slow? Do we move speed limit signs well away from it? Don't say it's 35 miles an hour here, and then you know 100 yards later it's 15 miles an hour. Do we put a sign up that says Slow down ahead, 15 miles an hour. Um, we have to treat people with respect, right? But people here are intelligent, right? I think everyone here wants to abide by the rules, right? But, you know, we have to help them along sometimes, right? It's, it's, a, it's a process and procedure, right? In the cyber world. Yeah. First, you have to monitor, because you can't move what you don't measure. That's business. If I don't measure what's going on, I can't move it. So what I would do, if, if we all believe that that's a process, and the rest of the board has to agree, right? Let's put a process in place to measure what's going on. Do we need to put those little things? And then we determine, here, we have a 1,000 cars going down Bentwater Drive, and I'm just making these numbers up. We have a thousand cars going down Bent Bentwater Drive, and 50% of them are speeding. We have an issue. I agree with you that we have to measure, but I don't feel the sense of urgency by anyone to risk seizure here. And unfortunately, people can access the speed limit signs if they want to. Yeah. And they can see the speed limit sign and they can see the speed there's a thing called a law out there that allows them to drive, so we really can't do too much about that, but we can measure, right? And if we measure it first and say, hey, these are the number of cars that are going down, we need to do something about it. You know, if, if we have a thousand cars and 10 are speeding, how large is our problem? Our problem is large to the individual that may be impacted by those 10 people, but overall, what do we need to do? My first step would be measure. But beyond that? Beyond, beyond that, de depending on what the evidence tells us to do, there would be certain levels of, of reaction we have to do based on our bylaws, based on our CCRs, right? So if the organization says, look, we have a lot of speeders going on here, then do we want to spend the money to get a speed gun and, and, and a camera? And then issue and issue the tickets, right? Do we want to inquire with the local police to give them the authority to set up a speed trap, right? Those are the things that we can do. Those are things we can investigate, and we can report that back in a transparent manner to the community. This is what we can do, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, speaking as a trustee, you mentioned you've got, you've got experience in the technology world. If you let the on the board, what role do you see technology playing on the board in terms of communication with members, uh, disseminating information, things of that nature? There's always a cost of technology, right? And we have to take a look at the cost benefit analysis, right, of, of where it is. But what I could see is certainly our, our membership meetings could be videotaped, right? Um, and we could definitely post those out. And we can also allow for people to converse with us real time from their house, right? There's things like uh, uh, FaceTime. If we do, in, in business what we do is have conference calls. And these conference calls, it allows everyone to dial in from wherever they're at, listen in, ask questions, and if, want, if they want, they could share their image, right? So we could use that tech, and that technology isn't that expensive. 
right? So, I mean, if you want to hear a meeting, you could dial in and listen. You want to pose a question, you type it in on your computer. The moderator says, you know, Al, well, there's a question from, you know, John Doe, and this is the question. And everyone can see the question, right, and you can do it. I would like to have more communication with the environment, just the way you would if you went to the local city, right, and there's a commission meeting. You get in front of everyone, you have a problem, you talk about it, right? You give someone to do it. I would like to see that, right? As opposed to being presented to, right? That's, that's what I would like to see. Thank you. So how much would that be to give a box box figure? For a, it would, it would probably cost about $2,000. That's free. You, there's many free, uh, uh, but, being a cyber person, cybersecurity, I always look at those, those uh, I, I'm the one person that reads all the stuff in behind it. Right, you're right, I know. But yes, you're right, there are, there are free ones. Yeah, but I, when I look at these things, a lot of times, like with our own POA website, if you guys go to our own POA website, you know that you agreed to indemnify the HOA. Do you know what that means? All right. So if someone is you know, silly enough to, to want to sue you know, the, the POA for the website, you agree to defend the POA. Why would you do that? I'm not a member of the online one because of that. I read those things, right? There's a risk to it. I'm already paying for the association. I'm already paying for those things. I brought this up before. Is there a way that we can go around this and, 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 and protect it? And there are. Right? But it's on there, right? When I posed the question to the board, I wasn't given an answer to say, hey, we'll investigate it, we'll look into that. That didn't occur. What, what occurred was, that's just the way it is. Right? So I, that's, that's my passion. I want to come in and I want to change things that make, to make the, the community a little bit more inclusive. Right. That's what I'm looking at doing. Right. Thank you for the question. Any others? Uh, next candidate is Jim Hostetler. I'd just like to make a technical announcement that uh, this microphone, if you use it, when you ask your question, the question will be recorded. Otherwise, what you get when you stand up and ask your question is whatever the general uh, microphone picks up. So if you would allow me to bring you the microphone, I would be happy to do so. Ready, set, go. Um, <clears throat> hello, property owners. My name is Jim Hostetler. Thank you for coming to this forum. I find them always uh, interesting and informative. It's been my privilege really to uh, be a trustee here for two years. We've only had a board for 26 months. I'm asking you to reelect me for three more years and I'm here to tell you why. I'm gonna read my presentation because I have a lot to say and I wanna make sure there's time left for questions. Also, my wife wrote it and I'd get killed if I didn't. <clears throat> I'm glad you laughed, that's a joke. Uh, please look at the uh, website for the details on my background and my qualifications that was written and put there for your purpose. I will leave time at the end for questions, but um, Pittwater is a designated large scale community. That means we have greater than a thousand properties and more than $2 million in annual operating budget. There's a limited number of those in this country, but we happen to be one of those few. For all property owners, um, I would offer you three takeaways from my remarks, three things to remember. One is change, one is specific solutions, and one are my personal objectives. Change has been a constant under this board since its inception 26 months ago. Eight property owners have served on the five-person board since July of 2017. Two have found that business and family obligations precluded them from delivering all they expected to, 
and one of the two resigned, and we still miss her. Back in 2017, on day one of the newly elected board's term, the first act was to rescind the rule that you had to register before an open meeting with a question, then you had to discuss it with the board, and then you were not allowed to talk about it again during the meeting. We fixed that on the first day, and that was our first act as a new board. We believe in transparency, we believe in openness, we believe in telling you everything we can possibly tell you about things that are done, but we don't tell you about things we're discussing because they may not ever come to fruition. We did two things to improve the property owner communications. One is we launched a new website, which was much more informative and comprehensive than the last one. And we also have an experiment going on called um, Bentwater Live. It's a Facebook-based social media. Uh, thus far, we've basically only concluded that it proves the adage, some people can see a field of roses and look at a field of roses and only see the thorns. The board has been very busy over these last 26 months. They updated the bylaws to reflect the property owner directed board. They updated the collection policy with real teeth. They developed a new code of conduct and ethics policy. They created a reserve plan, which we never had before in the 28 year history of the neighborhood and we created a reserve policy to go with it. Now a couple of things will be voted on in the next meeting, but it's worked, it's been completed. We implemented the golf cart registration process to protect the association from liability in the case of personal injury or property damage as a result of breaking a CCNR rule. And we subsequently listened to a, a property owner request for a four seat golf cart, and we quickly uh, acknowledged that and changed the policy. We installed a new general manager and many, many more things that you've probably heard if you've been coming to the quarterly meetings. The second thing that was very significant were transitions. We transitioned from a developer-directed board to a property-directed board. That was not a one-day event. I mean, that's ongoing. It's still happening. We're still developing important new policies and procedures to make certain that we have a foundation for future boards. We also transitioned from a community manager contract to self-management, and we did both of these two transitions in the same year, which is unheard of in a large-scale community. It just can't be done, we did it. We also transitioned all 45 of our employees to a professional employment organization, providing competitively priced health insurance, payroll, tax services, and safety consulting to all of our employees. Led by two volunteer board members, the POA also replaced a mold-infested POA office that was unsafe for property owners and staff. We had 21,000 outstanding blue cards that allowed open access to the neighborhood, and that was eliminated, providing additional security to the neighborhood. And the POA also added an automated member lane. Earlier this year, the board initiated a cybersecurity assessment to identify exposures to property owner, non-public information, and we will implement those recommendations when the committee completes its work, uh, hopefully before the end of this year. The important common thread, though, that I would point out to you is all of this activity occurred with absolutely no loss of service to property owners. Okay, no one has been impaired with all this activity going on. There's been a lot of discussion lately about park amenities. Two neighborhood-wide surveys during the last two years have both delivered the same result. Many property owners want more, yet fewer are willing to pay for them. The board has yet to hear concrete proposals for these amenities, so there are no decisions pending at this point but we're hopeful that before the end of the year, we will see some specific numbers, time frames, phasing, all that sort of thing. My proposal for gaining the attention of Bentwater on the North Shore, the owner of the country club, for various issues with amenities and possibly some new ones like 
a number of people have suggested something like a splash pad, is to invite David Sizelove to an orchestrated town hall. Orchestrated means we have the agenda control. The two most recent town hall events in which he participated disclosed the club's plans for the golf course upgrades and the patio. I think it's time for some new announcements. It's time to bring our groups together. And with a large vocal turnout from the BLO, the mob, the BCA, and the POA, I think we can get our points across and get the uh, Bentwater and the North Shore attention. The POA will take care of the amenities on the POA property and that which they control. The club should take care of their responsibilities like pools and club or, uh, locker rooms and so forth. That's their problem, not ours. My last point I'd like to make are my three personal objectives for my next term. Process improvement is very important to all of us. 75% of our annual spend as a property owner association is employee related. Yet we don't measure their performance or their productivity. The board must develop service improvement and expense reduction goals that all 45 employees are aligned with, not just the general manager. We need to reduce accounts receivable. Nine months ago, the board and staff began aggressively pursuing 161 seriously delinquent accounts that we inherited. This represented over $534,000. Since then, 71 of these delinquencies have been resolved, but 90 remain active matters. Of the 90, 39 are now in a stage of litigation. 22 more accounts have been given a final demand letter from our attorney. We expect to see some pretty good results in the next few months based on delinquent accounts actually paying up. Some of these folks are as high as $14,000. Some of these folks are people who will let it run up to fourteen dollars or $15,000, write us a check, and then run it up again. Some of these folks are the little old lady who says, I'm not paying you a nickel until I die and my heirs will take care of it. So, you know, we're never going to be at 100%, but uh, we can do some things to, to approach that. Speed control has been brought up here earlier. I think there's too many speeders out there that continue to terrorize our neighbors who walk, ride, and drive on our streets. Um, when they pass me, I lay on the horn. Really ticks my wife off. But I think it's up to all of us to remind those folks who are speeding or driving recklessly that they are doing so and it's violating our neighborhood laws. There's lots of solutions available to slow drivers down. Of course, speed bumps always come up. Speed humps are now coming up. Um, what we need to do is we need to get people off the streets as well. We need multiple solutions. It's not just uh, one single silver bullet that will solve this. So just to recap, my objectives, process improvement, reduce AR, and get speeding under control. Those things are tangible, measurable, and achievable. All of the candidates want to do a good job. We're all willing to step up to issues. We're all willing to consider new ideas. We're all willing to accept requests from all property owners. What differentiates me from the other candidates is that I have large-scale community board experience, specific to Bentwater. I've taken advantage of the last five years of membership in the Community Association Institute to read, research, and solicit ideas from thousands of my fellow CAI members. I began my service to the POA through participation on meaningful projects, learning along the way. I also have the time to contribute. I don't work. I don't have a young family that needs attention. I'm able to spend the time necessary to actually lead projects, develop meaningful policy, and provide necessary oversight of the staff. This means 20 to 50 emails a day and 10 to 12 hours a week working on board business, committee meetings, board workshops, and sometimes more in the weeks prior to a quarterly meeting. It's been a busy two years. There's work left to be done. With your support, I want to serve you for three more years. I learn something every, every month. My name is Jim Hostetler, and I appreciate your vote. Any questions? 
Yes, sir. Earl. Jim, uh, how are we going to address street replacement, not street repair, street replacement? Uh, actually, the way we hope to do it is avoid it because you're talking <laughs> millions, I'm talking millions of dollars to replace streets in Bentwater. And what's been done, as you've seen in the quarterly meetings that you've attended, is Terry and Paul Guggenheim have put together a very good maintenance program, which has turned the corner now, and we're seeing less and less cracks and uh, panels that need replacement and sections of the road, less, fewer potholes. I mean, we're, we're starting to see the, the uh, benefit of the work that's been done in terms of maintenance. There is no plan to replace streets. Doing so would be millions of dollars. I'm talking like over $100,000 per property owner. And it's, there's not gonna happen. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Yes, ma'am. Jerry? Jerry. Oh. You mentioned that the POA is not responsible for the country club, the yacht club, and the pools. Mm -hmm. um, what is the POA doing to work with the Belands? Because I consider the, those amenities to affect the values of our homes and affect whether or not people want to move here if they, if they have children or they want to use the pools and we have swim meets over there. Um, what's going to be done about forcing the Belands to upgrade those facilities that we're all paying dues on. Okay, I, I only can take exception to the word force. We have no control over Bentwater on the North Shore. They are a separate for-profit entity, totally uh, unique from us. So we can't force them to do anything. But as I suggested in my remarks, I think a good next step would be to uh, ask them to participate in a, a uh, a town hall that we put the agenda together and say here are the things we want to know about and stand uh, David up as a general manager or invite Chad as well to come in and tell us you know, what's on their radar, what's on their five-year plan, what kinds of things are they actually doing and at the same time we can point out some of the deficiencies that people notice you know in women's locker rooms and uh, places around the playground and stuff like that. The POA's responsibility is very precisely limited to that property which the POA owns. The country club is a separate property owner. So, you know, we can't get in their business. We don't expect them to get into our business. We can't force them to do anything. But I think the next step ought to be that we actually have a town hall meeting with those people. We have an excellent working relationship uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with Bentwater on the North Shore. Uh, Robert talks to them regularly, Steve has talked to them regularly, Terry has talked to them regularly over the years. So it's, um, it's not like we have an adversarial relationship. I share your concern about some of the amenities. We can't control that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next candidate is Chris Howell. First off, good afternoon, and thank you guys for being here. It shows a commitment to your community, and that's why we all are here, whether it be our existing trustees or all of us sitting in the audience. We have a community that we all love to be in, and that's important. We just need to figure out how we can make that community better, how we can take that community into the future. Uh, and that's kind of where I feel that I bring a fresh perspective in here in that with the newer generation that's coming in that's more family uh, with small kids, the area is growing. It's undeniable that we have more families coming in here. Uh, and families look for different amenities. This is a premier golf course. I mean, it's, it's the best. I love coming here. I don't golf, but I, I have a high expectation for the golf courses and the rest of the amenities. For me, when I came into Bentwater uh, from our neighboring community of April Sound, Driving in that front gate, no matter how my day was, everything just kind of melts away. It's between the overhanging trees and the lush golf courses. Uh, I knew it was home right when I first came in here. So I want to tell you a little bit about what my plan is 
if I'm elected as a trustee, and what some of the things that I would like to see implemented. Uh, we definitely have a deficiency in parks. I mean, the parks are old. Meadows Park is beautiful, it's scenic, but they have not been maintained. Uh, that's important to me. I have a two and a half year old daughter that I have full custody of, so when I look at a community, I look for the amenities that are gonna be consistent with what I'm gonna do with her. Uh, at some point, I would love for her to be out on the golf course and be on the LPGA at some point in time, but that's a little bit in the future. So uh, I think I bring a younger perspective to things. I think that the demographics of Montgomery as a whole are changing, and in order to stay, uh, well, in order to basically keep up with the times, we need to figure out what can we do to not only keep Bentwater the premier golf community, but how is it also going to be a uh, family-friendly uh, and active community because we do have a wide range of demographics here. Uh, the younger community is moving in, older community is moving in, there's some transition going on, uh, but I think that I bring that perspective to where I could work with everybody here. Uh, Jim mentioned, you know, as of, as of this date, they hadn't received anything on the parks proposals. It took me eight days to get proposals on new park equipment. I've got them in hand. They may not be approved by the board, but I'll submit them to the board. <laughs> Uh, I met with various playground contractors. I walked Meadows Park. I said, these are things that I think the community, based on the survey, has uh, annotated that they want. And I also have proposals for a dog park. So I think that with that, I bring high energy to where I will get things done. If the community will sit and reach out to me and say, these are the things that are important to us, uh, I've got the energy and the know-how in order to be able to implement those things and then work with the board. It's kind of what I do for a living is I work with a whole bunch of people, whether it be uh, sitting in deposition at times or acting as an expert witness or meeting with homeowners on a daily basis and what I do with my company. Uh, I always have believed that working with a network of cross-functional people is the best way that we can accomplish the things that we need to accomplish to make the community better for everyone. So uh, I'd like to give you a little bit about myself, but I'd rather do that in a different setting where we could really enjoy each other's company and I, I uh, look forward to doing that. I recognize some faces in here, but there's a whole lot that I look forward to getting to know more of. So what I'd like to do is really open it up to questions because I think that that's what the board's job is, is to answer the questions and reflect what you, the community, as a whole, think that we can do to make this place better. So, yes, sir. <laughs> My voice generally carries. Chris, thank you. Yes, sir. Chris, you know, we've heard a lot today about a board in transition, you know, shifting from one frame of uh, governance to a second frame of governance. We've heard a lot about that, and we certainly respect the challenges that, uh, that go along with that kind of transition as a board. How long has it been, 26 weeks or something? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's not been a long time since they've been operating differently. But what I haven't heard, uh, and, and I'll, I'll ask you this, what does good look like? What's the idealized design uh, that you would like as a property owner and, and as somebody representing us? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think it starts with basic maintenance uh, of everything, whether it be the POA grounds, the roads. I mean, those things are important. Our roads aren't the best looking roads. I think that's pretty undeniable. When you drive down my street at Hillsboro, it looks like there's spiderweb veins of black tar going everywhere. Uh, I've noticed that in other communities. So we do have to, Jim's right, it's gonna be expensive, but things depreciate no matter what they are. You can't indefinitely extend out the lifespan of these roads. It's just not possible. So at some point in time, we're gonna to have to be real with that and realize that yes, although it may be a $20 million project, at some point the generations moving into Bentwater down the road are going to have to burden that cost. And we need to do everything to be proactive in making sure that that's not a lump sum burden. I know that we have our street fund that uh, looks pretty healthy to me. I mean based off of what I've seen the maintenance costs are being and versus the cost that's in there and the capital reserve fund for things. Uh, but we do need to honestly increase that. We need to be proactive in planning for the future as to what's gonna happen. We can't just say, and this is no disrespect to Jim, but we just can't say that we're just gonna try and indefinitely prolong the life of things. Uh, all that does is have a dilapidated community. And at some point in time, all of our property values are gonna be affected by that. So for me, from my standpoint, I wanna see increased maintenance. I want to see us being very productive in planning for the future of things that are going to be, we, you know, we have to have foresight. We have to say, okay, that fence is probably going to need to be replaced in the next five years, or this road is going to need to be replaced. And we have to collectively come together and figure out a way to set a budget for that and planning so that it's not just a offset cost that all of a sudden we go, hey, we've got to come up with $20 million to replace our roads. Does that answer your question, sir? Thank you. Patty? Sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm part of the faction of the community that feels that we're not listened to and we're dismissed or we're kind of looked down upon because we're malcontents. How do you propose to bring the community back together or for those of us who don't feel listened to, to start to feel more like part of the community? I think that all starts with uh, building a community of inclusiveness. I mean, all of us are in this same community. So no matter what our religion is, our ethnicity is, or any of the other variables, I mean, we all live in this community and we are all uh, tied together inextricably by that fact. So. I think for me, a lot of openness. I think that uh, really engaging the community when it comes to open board meetings is important. I think that we need to utilize readily available technology too. Uh, Zoom is something that I use on a regular basis. I think that if we allow a chance for everybody to interact more, um, you know, I mean, we've got a large community and there's, I don't wanna, I'm not good at guessing things, but we're probably less than 50 people here. We're not engaging a large percentage of the community and we need to do that. Uh, that's really important, but we need to be able to listen to everybody's concerns, whether we feel personally that they're unfounded or not. As a board member and as a trustee, that is still your job to field the questions of the community and give them an answer to the questions that they have at place, no matter how unfounded you personally may feel that they're being. So I think that we need to have that spirit of inclusiveness. I think that we really need to come together as a community and realize that what's important to you may not be important to me, but at the end of the day, is it all important to the community and for making this community and keeping this community a great place? Thank you. So you're welcome. <laughs> Chris, you're next, Al. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> Chris, uh, would you share with us your thoughts on expanding committees, maybe developing ad hoc committees, that sort of thing, for issues that are out there so that we could maybe help address and placate some of the folks that have issues? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely think it's a wonderful idea. I think that the, you know, we don't want to get too many subcommittees out there doing too many different things. Uh, but I think we do want to utilize the experience that we have within the community. I mean, we've got people in here with all different backgrounds and a very diverse community uh, from attorneys, insurance, uh, school teachers, you name it. And I think we would be ill-founded not to use the experience that we have within the community in those different areas of expertise. Uh, that's what makes us great, you know, that, and that's what we need to do is be able to bring together people that have the experience in the various er uh, avenues and be able to work together because you're gonna know things that I have no clue about and, and it would not make sense for me to try and learn that and try and put together something when I've already got you that's willing and, and able to volunteer to do so. I mean, we're, uh, you know, the, the demographics of this community, like I said, probably steer more towards retirees at this point in time and, and I think that that's a wonderful thing but you also got a lot of time on your hands so you can volunteer within the community and everybody has expressed to me that they want to do that. Everybody wants this community to be better uh, and that's the beauty of it. So yeah, having subcommittees to do different things that are important to the community, uh, absolutely 100%. <laughs> Hold it, Terry. I just have one question. I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the representation at this meeting and many of the meetings is slim to none. Yes, ma'am. I question, how do you get, how do you suggest we get more people in the community to participate and be engaged and attend the meetings. I mean, it's not like that we don't advertise. Sure. They have it at the front gate. Every time you drive in the front gate, they have a, something on the board on sure. telling you that there's a meeting coming up. Yeah. There, you get emails, you get Facebook, all of these things we're already doing, and yet we don't have the people participating. Do you have any suggestions how to improve that? Uh, you know, I do actually. Uh, for me, I was not getting the POA emails, so I didn't know about the board meetings coming up and I wanted to be engaged in my community, but uh, it took me making a post on Bentwater Live. I think that Bentwater Live is a great step. You know, it, Facebook now goes through generations and, and I think that Bentwater Live has really shown a lot of engagement, not all of it positive, but not a lot of it negative, honestly. I think that we've had more activity on Bentwater Live than I've seen on any other form so far. So I think that that's important to continue with modern technology that's readily available to us to disseminate the information. And I also think that a lot of people don't want to just attend in here, but they would probably watch if it was streamed to Facebook Live. I think that if there was different medians for them to be able to engage with the community, I think the more that we have, uh, the better in that regard. 
Yes, ma'am. I just want to ask a question sure. to everybody. Uh, I don't mean it hostile or anything. I just want to know the facts. Sure. Do other surrounding communities like April Sound and Walden own their yacht clubs and clubs? And uh, as, as opposed to the, do the property owners own them? I really can't speak on other communities. We really have three country club communities here that we can choose from. I mean, Bentwater probably, and in my opinion, is the premier country club community. Yes, we do not own those resources, but we have April Sound and then we have Walden. Um, you know, people in that regard, uh, I think Bentwater is obviously the chosen one. We're inextricably tied to Bentwater on the North Shore. There's no doubt about it. They're tied to us, we're tied to them, and there's nothing that we can do about that. But what we do need to do is be able to have an open dialogue with them and voice our uh, POA members' complaints. And we need to say, I mean, I'm sorry, but the pools are not maintained. Uh, from what I can see, they've put a lot of emphasis on the golf course, um, and that's great. But, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't golf, but if the golf courses were in a state of disrepair, I'd be the first person out there fighting on behalf of our homeowners to make them fix that. Uh, but, right. Oh. I've heard stories about how wonderful the Yacht Club was and how people would congregate on a Saturday night and how, and, and I mean, we need to get back to that. But now, like everybody else has said, we can't force Bentwater on the North Shore to do anything. But what we can do is use our collective resources to sit down with them and say our members deserve better. You know, and, and that's the thing. We, we all kind of know that it takes the Bentwater POA to enforce collections of Bentwater on the North Shore. So they do rely on us more than what I think people give us credit for. I think that collectively we have a lot of power together to voice our opinions on things and to really make sure that we get them to maintain and enhance the amenities that we pay for. Uh, we're, we're tied to that. We don't have an option to pay for it or not. It's not like if we get bad service at a restaurant down the road, we can just choose not to go there. We're paying for these amenities and we deserve better in the community. So. All right, my, my question goes along those lines um, where you mentioned that we can't force um, uh, the country club to do things, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we're forced to be a member. What sure. is your opinion on mandatory membership? My opinion is really irrelevant because it's what it is. I mean, it, it, to be honest with you, we don't have, uh, yeah, if I could opt out of it, I probably would. Um, so, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my opinion is just not relevant in it, to be honest with you, because it is what it is. And every one of us that buys a property in here is aware that we have to have at a minimum the social club membership. So whether I want it or not, when every one of us bought our property in here, we're aware that we have to have it. So that's, just, that's not even something that I think is debatable. No? Yes, ma'am. I just need to clarify what I mean by force. Uh -huh. Are there legal means that we can use to protect the amenities that we are paying our dues for, that the POA could work with the BLAs to um, encourage them legally to keep those amenities at the um, level sure. that we need them to be in order to maintain our I would defer to somebody that's a better expert in that because I don't know if we have any legal recourse to actually do anything. Uh, I think that if you read Bentwater on the North Shores, um, their covenants and stuff, they've, they've got, it's very favorable to the developer. Just to, if I'm being completely frank, it is very favorable to the developer. They have much more power and influence in it than we do. Uh, but that's where our collective voices come in. And, you know, they, like I said, we're inextricably tied and we're going to be tied. And we have to figure out the best way that we can work together. I think that it's important that the POA has some POA controlled assets, such as parks, enhanced things that a lot of us have expressed that we want. But I think that we also need to really sit down with them and say these amenities are failing in so many areas. I think my time's up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, quite a day. Uh, I'm last up, and I will tell you that I'm glad that on Wednesday night I will be first up. Um, What's your name? Steve Cook. I am the uh, presently the president of the board of Pete, the, the board of trustees. I've been on the board about a year, almost exactly a year, having been brought in to uh, take a, take a spot of one of the people who was mentioned earlier, who withdrew due to business uh, constraints. And when the new board was uh, in 
in, uh, put in place in, uh, a year ago, uh, last September, I uh, was elected uh, president. Um, I'm going to start this off a little differently than, uh, than maybe the other speakers have. I'm going to tell a little story and then I'll expand on kind of my view of, of Bentwater and life in Bentwater. I first heard this story six or seven months ago as a bit of a gossip in the country club, but I didn't really believe it. And so I didn't think more about it until it actually happened to me. And uh, the version of the story as it happened to me was I was down in Houston at a social event with former colleagues and people I do some work with, uh, consulting and the like. And as you do in these kind of events, you know, you say, where do you live? And you talk to friends of friends and people you may or may not know. And I said, of course, we live in Bentwater. We have our residences in Bentwater. And that person happened to say, you live in Bentwater? Why would you live there? And it turns out they have friends in a different community here up on the lake and heard from all the social media sites that are publicly available out there of all these quote unquote problems that Bentwater has. And when I heard that, I said, you've got it wrong. This is the best place in the lake to live. You come up and visit me, and they have. And they've agreed. And, and, uh, and I will tell you, uh, as long as I'm involved with this board, you will never hear a negative thing about Bentwater come out of my lips. My Bentwater class is half to two-thirds full with all of the great things we have fortunate to live here. And I'm gonna, I, and I, you know, I, I didn't, when I was put on the board a year ago, I didn't have any preconceived notions. I didn't know what the challenges were going to be. I didn't know what the tasks were going to be. I didn't know what the opinions of the memberships were going to be. But I knew we had, at that time, about a 14 or 16 month history of membership control. And there were probably a lot of things we need to look at. We focused on the positive in those years, in, in that year. And we've found the things that could be developed better, and we've worked on developing them. You heard a lot from Jim Hostetler about what's happened in the last year or so on. I won't repeat that. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that this, we have a very strong staff here. The staff and the management are very good. But they had, under the developer's control, and the developer had, you know, he's got his own private business, he's trying to make money, so he had the way, to, he had the right to run it the way he wanted to. But now it's our way to run it. And the first thing we learned is these people are very good, but they've been micromanaged for too long. When we started to let them do their jobs, they were finding ways to save money, to do their job better, and to do things in a better fashion that every all of us want to have happen here in Bentwater. We, the, we as a board are still learning on how to get out of their way and letting them do their jobs. There as a, as a board, as was discussed earlier, the role of a board is to take a look down and kind of be like the, the, the captain of a cruise ship, you know? Turn the, turn the wheel a little bit to get it going in a slightly better direction and even more than a little bit if the direction's really bad. Most of the things here are not really bad. There are things we can do to save money. You've heard Jim talk about it. There are things you can do, we can do to get more volunteer committees, but we've had finance, we've got a volunteer finance committee, communications committee, cyber committee, audit committee, uh, finance, there's one other I'm missing, and then we had an informal parks committee, and then we have an informal a committee that helped us when we went to electronic gate access. So when we've needed or when we've wanted volunteers to help us out in areas that have been suggested to us, the volunteers come to us. We, it's not a hard task. And, and, that, and that's something that whoever's on the board going forward will, I'm, I'm sure, will continue to, to work on. Do we have challenges? Sure. We've been talking a lot here today. A lot of the members do not understand or disagree with the difference between Bentwater on the North Shore, who owns the country club and the yacht club and the pools, and the POA. As, as Jim said, though, the, the Bentwater on the North Shore has been very responsive. You know, we, my wife and I have lived here 12 years, and 10 years ago, the golf courses were not in good shape. They're in great shape now, and now we get tournaments throughout the year on regional and national uh, uh, organizations that want to play here. 
the, the tennis courts were here. We had like two or three tennis courts 10 years ago. Now they've got, what, six or eight, including a couple that are pickleball. These are directly responsive to what the members wanted. Um, and, and so and there are ways to talk to the Bentwater on the North Shore, but, but if we tried, as a POA, tried to get involved with telling Bentwater on the North Shore what they should do in their business, and I'm, this is not my specialty area of the law, I'm a lawyer, but I would, be, I would be worried that we would be risking a tortious interference in corporate interest by telling them what they should do in their business. Uh, and so we have it. We've got a great relationship with them, but what we do is work with them, and they work with us, and it's to the benefit of us all. And I'll commit to you, if I'm re-elected to the board, we're going to continue to work with Bentwater and the North Shore, and we'll help to understand what the members want. That's what we've done in the past year, and I think it's been very successful. I get questions, some of the questions I get from, uh, from friends is why, why doesn't the board be a little more stronger in, in the responses to what we see posted on social media? And the, frankly, the, the answer is, is that we have a code of conduct. We talk about a lot of things in the board, and as Jim, I think, mentioned, is that until it's, until it's a decision of the board, it's not something for public consumption. And so we're not, and, and even if it is, we don't publicize who's for, who's against, a certain whatever. It's a decision of the board and we all go forward on that basis. And I, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not gonna say much more. This, I've been a little stronger in my emotions here after an hour and a half of, of, of hearing a, of a lot of things that are all very valid. But I think there's a reality that needs to be addressed, and that is, first, this is a great place to live. Period. End of story. Great places to live are not free. We haven't really talked much about the budget, but since the, the members took over, we're now in our third year of of, of under budget year end closes and the, the budget for this next year is down from the past two years. So are there other areas as Jim man mentioned and others managed that we can save money? And absolutely yes and we're looking at them. But as I said, now we're to the point where we understand the strengths of our people and we understand what they know they can do better than they've been able to do in the past. And now we can help work with them for the benefit of all of us. And that's really what is going to continue the strength of Bentwater into the future. Thank you. Am I the only one with no questions? Well, okay. Okay, I think we've heard from the candidates and um, we'll officially close this session. I remind you that there will be another one on uh, Wednesday night. Let's hope we have a, a, a good turnout. And I just, I can't help myself. I just can't help myself. So take it as it is, it's not tar, it's hot rubber. <laughs> Okay.